Please welcome to the stage Farid F. Shahank, Chairman and CEO of Dogus Group, Bob Moritz, Global Chairman of PWC, and His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed bin Hamid bin Qasim Al Thani, Minister of Commerce and Industry for the State of Qatar, for a conversation with Bloomberg Stephanie Flanders. Well, uh, well, thank you for being here. All of that financial discussion was a good introduction to this conversation about the real world of globalization, goods and services. What's the future? Are supply chains being unpicked? Uh, is the world being polarized economically? Bob Moritz, I want to start with you. I mean, there's, there are two groups I find when I talk to people around the world who look at the current situation, there's one group that says this is globalization in reverse. Changes that didn't begin with COVID perhaps, but have certainly been exacerbated by COVID, uh, are unpicking supply chains and sending us back to a world in which countries turn inward. That's one version. The other version is this is globalization in transition. You may have some of those adjustments of regrouping of, of supply chains and economic relationships, but trade in services, in ideas, in data is actually expanding still very rapidly. Um, and perhaps we're moving to a less US-dominated vision of globalization, but it's not the end. What, what do you see when you look at the world? So when we look around the world, <clears throat> we're probably more in the latter category. The reality is the benefits of global which have been well regarded and well founded hit a pause, but the need for interaction amongst the globe and all its stakeholder continues. So I'm going to call this globalization that needs to be rewired. Will it be more difficult to manage the way we have historically done? The answer is yes. When you look at the complexities and the nationalization and the various policies issues that are out there, when you add on it to the concept of services and data, that adds another level of complexity to it. But let's also base this on some facts. The reality is the world sees, perhaps outside of this region, a tremendous battle between the US and China. The reality is the trade between those two countries has never been higher. Even with the rhetoric from a political perspective, what shows up on the media and otherwise, there's a natural dependency that I think the world is gonna see and continue to need on a going forward basis. And the question is, how do we actually move forward and rewire that world and get used to that new world order for us to participate in and for all to benefit from? And Farid Shahag, I mean, I remember seeing you at the World Economic Forum many years, a Davos man, if ever there was one, talking about uh, the rise of emerging market economies and indeed your company was sort of symbolic of that and Turkey's increasing role in the global economy. A lot has changed since then. I mean, do you see a, a permanently changed world? Well, to be very frank and uh, open, uh, Stephanie, the people who attended these conferences are the same people. It's uh, shockingly different how overnight the views can be reversed. Uh, I'm not only an optimist, I'm a realist. And as a person, I have seen many crises. I've seen many financial crises. I've seen many uh, inflationary environments. Uh, name of the game, first of all, let's not be like a rabbit at night between the two lamps of a car frozen. We are very smart people. And if we can get the collectivity, inclusivity, collective wisdom in the world, I think we can solve this issue. Yes, one way or another, we are going to face recession. We may face stagflation. But we should get into this environment very smart. We should be prepared to get a collective 
action, like we have done in 2008 crisis. You know, this G20, B20, government authorities, the central bankers, the type of collective action that's taken, even looking at the COVID period, uh, I think uh, people never expected that vaccine would be found in a month, not in years, that vaccine would be distributed uh, so soon. And look, yes, last year I was in a mask in a room giving an interview in the Qatar Economic Forum. Thank God, Alhamdulillah, everybody is here. We are now discussing other issues. The name of the game, the game is, for me, to be very frank, some of the issues we talked about in Davos years ago. Right. I think now we are faced with the reality. I think certain institutions that we created after Matt of World War II, with the realities of World War II and after Matt, fantastic. Now they should be operating in an adjusted manner for talking to and for giving chance to many more rather than that years, those years reality. I think inclusivity is very important for this. Uh, I believe globalization uh, is, uh, is here to stay in a different version, yes. Uh, as we always say, we always say, but we forget sometimes. Uh, the only thing don't change is the change itself. So just say change too. The only thing is that we have to create agility in world organizations like in World Bank, IMF, United Nations, to tackle the issues with an agility, without waiting. And uh, World Health Organization has done a fantastic job during the COVID. I think in a pandemic of that kind, if we were able to go through this, uh, since 1990s, the trade over G G the gross uh, GMP of the world came from 36, 38 percent to 58. There are buyers, there are sellers, there are suppliers, there are producers, there are consumers. You cannot just think about one side. You have, we have to think about both sides. We have to think about the developing world. We have to think about the developed world. This game is played all together, Stephen. We cannot just keep the game for one section. It has to be played all together. If theater is played all together, this will be a beautiful uh, story. And I believe in the humankind. I think we can do it. Uh, it's a time to get together, regroup, and challenge the facts and uh, create a collective wisdom. We will get back to some of those uh, elements but, Excellency, I've come to you last because I was interested in what uh, opportunities and perhaps changes, new opportunities, uh, there are for Qatar that you see coming out of this emerging, this new form of globalization. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me in this uh, forum. Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, you know, it's always good to hear from the private sector first because they know the challenges that are facing the global world today. Your extra, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, before COVID, if you ask anyone in the room today about globalization and where it's going, we all believe that globalization is going to continue. There is no weaknesses in the current system. The current system that is in place uh, was robust, providing uh, all humans all around the world, consumers with very low prices of products and services at a very low price. COVID was a testament on the system, and it shows that resiliency was a challenge, which led to a huge increase in, in uh, demand in many areas. Medical goods dropped significantly, the trade of medical goods during COVID. Uh, so what we have done over here in Qatar and uh, which we did as well in COVID, we tried to work with the international community to make sure that there is a huge uh, supply of uh, goods and services of medical goods, and we moved on that. And in terms of resiliency, we built resiliency even prior to COVID. For example, in food security, we built a strong resiliency from 2017. Qatar is considered one of the highest uh, in food resiliency. Uh, openness, we adapted a lot of openness uh, 
reforms, liberalization of trade. So I believe in the future, the, the way forward for us here in, uh, in the region as well is to make sure that we could make sure that resiliency is strong and uh, try to enable more of uh, co-working with, with the international organizations. If we look at previously, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, I mean, trade, international trade in the last 70 years was, was around 5% of the total GDP of countries. Today, we're standing at 55%. Here in Qatar, our country is very dependent on international trade. All smaller nations, we are 90% uh, of our GDP is coming from trade. Uh, so definitely we are already in today on a fundamental reform on attracting further trade. Well, Bob, I'm struck though, because often the it's optimists and the pessimists think supply chains are going to change a lot. And they either think it's going to change for the better or for the worse, but they're going to change a lot. I mean, your company would be very aware of it if behind the scenes <coughs> businesses everywhere were unpicking and examining our sense from reporters on the ground is it's a lot easier said than done, but what are you seeing? So if you look back five years ago, people, as they examined their supply chain, were looking for a reduction of concentration risk, but not necessarily bringing things back to the home plant. If you look today, you do have a rewiring and a rethinking of the entirety of the supply chain, and it goes to the following thesis. First, it goes to the issue of how do I reduce the dependency on any key concentration risks that I may have and have optionality built into that. The second piece is because of the concept of security, as demonstrated by the energy issue and the upcoming food issue, you do have the challenge around security and therefore a need to bring some of that more so back home into home country to the extent it's possible and we recognize it's not necessarily possible in our parts of the world. The third thing that's happening is we will see now a concept of having sufficiency and resiliency, excess of supply, to deal with the spikes. And we talked about that with some of the earlier panels in terms of the ups and downs. The energy crisis and, and Kennelly, the energy supply chain is no different in that regard. And the last thing that is being thought about is how do I redesign the supply chain with ESG in mind? So those four phenomenons are asking then the corporates to really do a re-examination of all that they do. And I want to be very clear on this. When we talk supply chain, it's not only for goods and commodities, it's also to services and human capital. And we're also seeing a redesign of the human capital concepts as we think about the great resignation and other elements of it. So there's a lot of work to be done, no easy answers to it but you look for the concept of security, resiliency, and affordability, and a redesign with an ESG agenda within it. And does the, I'm wondering whether the financial piece of this is going to change, or the financial sector, and financial globalization as, as we've known it, is that gonna change more potentially than some other sectors? I mean, uh, Farid uh, Shahang, I know you actually had, had got rid of your bank a few years ago, uh, is that because, you know, do, where, what do you see as the, is finance a less attractive area? No, uh, Stephanie, let's not say get rid of it. It's a portfolio shuffling. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Pretty big bit of reshuffling. To be honest with you, I think the uh, banking will always be there. But today's banks will change. So the banking needs of the people, the financing of, uh, need of the people in the world will still be there. So we will use more technology, uh, more data on getting to know our customers. I'm staying R because my heart still lies with the banking. Uh, I love the business. Uh, I think finance will be very important. And uh, in a couple of G20s before I was representing my country, Turkey, and uh, the infrastructure development, especially, uh, these big projects are very much important and they should continue. Uh, just namely, and this again may give you a hint of globalization, we just uh, finished in Istanbul a 1.2 kilometer uh, uh, along the Bosphorus, a project called Galata Port. Uh, this is the first port that uh, 
clients from the uh, cruise ships go underneath to go through passport control and everything like this. And, you know, and those, in these even instances, you find financing. And if you cannot find financing, this cannot come to, so financing in globalization is very important, I think. Secondly, uh, wise capital or good capital uh, still be there, will still be there as part of globalization. Uh, I can proudly say that uh, we just uh, created a partnership with the uh, QIA in uh, our uh, global FMB business. Now I can proudly say that after Temasek owning 17% of our business, now 20% uh, QIA is just coming. These investments don't happen if you don't believe in the future of globalization. And does the reaction, just to push back a little bit, I mean, one of the claims about the changing change for finance would be that the US and European response to the invasion of Ukraine has changed the stakes and caused people to question whether their assets will be secure within a US or a European jurisdiction, and that that provides an opportunity outside those traditional bits of the global financial market. I mean, do, do you recognize that? And then, of course, I would wonder whether there's an opportunity. Well, I, I, I think His Excellency will give a <laughs> very good uh, answer to that. But uh, I think, you know, as in anything that's facing us today uh, with the, uh, this undesired situation in Europe, uh, Ukraine, there are certain measures being taken. Uh, but at the end, uh, we will keep on investing. Uh, the capital will find, uh, again, places to uh, invest. And I see these times as an extreme pendulum. We are on now one extreme, it will correct again. Uh, so I think financing this time will be okay. Yes, there are some measures being taken, but uh, once we solve all these questions, we're gonna go back to the old times. Uh, maybe in two, three years' time, again, we are, we are here together, we can have this session. Yeah, I think we, we can see that, as Bob mentioned, you know, the world is going to see re rewiring. And we, I see we are seeing that right now. I mean, in terms of investments, uh, investments in 2021 were around $1.8 trillion across the globe. And uh, this is higher 60% than 2020. In 2022, for example, if I give you some numbers here in Qatar, last year we were attracting FDIs at around one point. $8 billion during this year all in 2022 till date we are attracting more than $3 billion all in the capital market. So this as well shows you that the ongoing uh, conflict, it's as well changing how we are seeing the world and where our business is reallocating their funds. But and specific, I mean, obviously the gas business yeah. has been transformed by what's happened in the last few months. How does that change the way you're looking in the future? Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, this is, I mean, the numbers that we maybe that I was mentioning, these are uh, the three billion the attraction. These are all including the investments and capital market. If we take the announcements that happened uh, even today uh, when ExxonMobil announced the joint investment, shows you the amount of FDI that is taking place. I believe the energy demand is still going to be there, and uh, the investments in, uh, in energy and other sectors are going to continue increasing. So we will see more shift in the investments in the region, it will be, instead of, for example, focus on certain geographies in Asia, I think the Middle East will attract further investments in financing. I'm interested that uh, Chairman Chahang talked about collective action. I mean, one of the things that makes people gloomy about the future is the feeling that we don't, there isn't a, an, a body that can reflect shared economic values and get things done. You talked about global financial crisis. That was the G20 that responded. Very divided now. The G last G20 meeting, there was a walkout by the US and other countries. So, Bob, I mean, Bob, I think everyone, I mean, how important is that that we, that we don't agree on some of those fundamental economic questions uh, now? Stephanie, I don't think uh, we can solve a global problem or glo global uh, pro problems with just local or regional solutions. This is, when saying it, uh, it comes out to be maybe too optimistic, but really 
It's a collective action. But where Inc will that come and from? And resulting in, as much as possible, inclusive benefit for the whole as much as possible. The thing I would say, Stephanie, is that we are going to see more regional, multilateral organizations form as a, as a, an alternative to some of those global mechanisms that we had previously. The question that's on the table is, as you think about those like countries or like institutions coming together, are they actually trying to solve them for just the region, or are they trying to solve them for the, the world? And we do see, as you look at COVID-19, as you look at the issues around more broadly data or climate, you see the challenges that are more global in nature. The question is, are those regional institutions, those of the future, going to be connected sufficiently with some kind of connected tissue so we at least are connecting the dots around the world to get to solving yes. the problems that have to happen? And it's going to be, again, a rewiring of what's needed in the future because you have had a shift when you look at the realities of the U.S. playing such a dominant role in the last 70 years, 80 years, to Kennedy a lesser role when you look at the growth of the economy and Kennedy the importance of the demographics of the world that we're living in today. And how, how can you, I mean, how can Qatar navigate that if there is, you have allies all over the world, uh, but it's not clear what the new rules will be, or they'll be, we don't even know whether there will be overlapping jurisdictions. Yeah. How do you see that? I think the trend is going on right now. First of all, for us in Qatar, we, we are focusing on more bilateral agreements with our friends and partners. Just before coming to the panel, we were having a bilateral agreement with Georgia, for example, on economic and technical partnerships. So I believe moving forward, uh, the bilateral agreements will take place between us and other countries, and I believe Many countries in the world are going to that direction. As my colleagues mentioned, the bilateral system that is currently today is facing a bit of challenges, and it would require a reform. So I think the way forward is for more bilateral agreements. But it does seem it's very hard now to see where that's going to come from, yeah. because we have some pretty wide disagreements about how to approach these things. I mean, I guess, I mean, even in mean, your own country, in Turkey, we now have 72% inflation. Foreign investors have, by and large, come out of Turkey. A very different approach to economic policy. We've uh, got a long way to go <laughs> to, uh, you, to, the, yes, to the story you described. This type of environment is an amazing opportunity to invest, especially like a country like Turkey. I have never seen such asset prices. The uh, demographic benefit of Turkish population, the technology advancements, there are some amazing uh, things happening. And when uh, my friend talked about the, just touching demographics, in all these issues, we are forgetting about demographics. And within that, I'm not going to talk about the aging of the population, some countries losing population, and so forth for innovation, for advancement, for their contribution to social welfare and all these kind of things. I want to talk about Z generation. These kids have no nation. They have a different state of mind. And they want things now. It's an interesting. This COVID, one of the benefits to me, apart from all the minuses, was I got to know my daughter. <laughs> and. Uh, apart from giving problems at home to my wife, because she's not used to me being at home, uh, I really uh, see a generation coming. They're amazing people. They're, they're born into tech. They are technology. We learned technology. We grew up with technology. They are technology. They are the ones in Twitter. They are the ones in this and that uh, platform. And uh, believe me, uh, this uh, sustainability, clean energy, environment, equality, the discussions that we have for them are must, they are reality. So everybody, father, mother at home, the company leadership, the governments, everybody, we have to really consider because, uh, you know, Z generation in my company, uh, they are the people that I work with. I have to get to know them. 
They are at the same time, they are my clients. I have to get to know them. And uh, the, I'm still listening to the 80s music. I don't even understand their music that they're listening. So among all these problems, we have to be very careful with this new generation coming. They're going to create a lot of voice. And we have to be, rather than reacting, we have to accept them to understand what they want. I think we have to, we have to leave it there. As, as someone who has a 16-year-old son, I'm a bit worried about if he's the future, I'm God help us all. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much to all of you.